we need cooperation in two main major fields. One is uh, technical equipment. Greeting likewise goes to the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation from the United States. They're treating their population the best that they can. I think it's fantastic. The students get invaluable experiences. I'm Armenian descent. I have some obligation. Hello, I'm Stan Coleman. I'm in Stepanakart in the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. It is a small war-torn country in eastern Armenia. And I've come here with the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation as they travel throughout the world doing humanitarian surgery. Join us for the next half hour as we look at the many problems of this small nation. The Hope for Tomorrow Foundation sent a medical team of doctors from all over the country. That included two plastic surgeons, three orthopedic surgeons, two vascular surgeons, an anesthesiologist, a radiologist, a nurse practitioner, and a registered nurse. Nestled in a beautiful valley in the southern Caucasus, Stepanakarta is the capital of the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. It is the heart of a disputed Armenian nation within Azerbaijan. The two have fought and technically are still at war over this dispute, leaving this enclave devastated and in desperate need of nearly everything. As attested to by an American-Armenian doctor who has been working here for 20 years. First of all, I really am very uh, gratified by hearing about uh, your uh, organization and its uh, purpose of helping people in need. Uh, subspecialties are always needed uh, because uh, you can manage primary care with uh, limited resources. You can even manage general type of uh, specialties, but when it comes to surgical subspecialties, the need is immense because those are very highly technology dependent, and that's something that sometimes they lag behind because of finances. We need cooperation in two main major fields. One is uh, technical equipment. We need modern technical equipment, and second, we need uh, professional training of our personnel. And in this respect, uh, we hope very much. Uh, uh, to need, deepen cooperation like with your organization. Uh, they, need, they need everything. I mean, they're, they, they're treating their population the best that they can. Uh, they can take care of relatively minor procedures. They can do an appendectomy. They can do a hernia or a fee. Uh, but there's no cardiac surgery that would ever be done. There's no uh, what we call free flaps that would ever be done. Uh, major injuries are... Uh, uh, very hard to take care of. It's, uh, you take your chances if you're going to live in this area of this country. Especially hard hit were two hospitals, the Republican Hospital in Stepanakart and the Plastic Surgery Center in Shushi, just 20 miles up the valley wall. The view from the third floor veranda of this hospital in Shushi is magnificent. Yet, inside, the ravages of war are very evident. This is what the first two floors look like. In the United States, this building would be condemned. But there are signs of growth. On the third floor is a state-of-the-art plastic surgical unit donated by an Armenian native living in France. What we found was some of that. The buildings are showing signs of a recent war. Uh, the hospital here is in tremendous amount of disrepair. Fortunately, the hospital has had some philanthropic help from a French-Armenian person who renovated the operating suite and that's worked well for us. The local um, nurses and doctors here have been quite helpful getting things running and we found a variety of cases that were able to do some work here and really help out the local people. This is the Republican Hospital in Stepanakart. If you look over my shoulder at the front of the building, you can see bullet holes and mortar holes from when the war was going on. This is where the Hope for Tomorrow team came to do their work. Here too, the war has taken its toll. It's hard to imagine why anyone would be shooting at a hospital. But just behind this war-torn building, they are building a state-of-the-art hospital. But in the meantime, working here is almost like medicine in the Middle Ages and there's no guarantee the new building will be equipped any better. A point not lost on Buffalo orthopedic surgeon Robert Slominski as he operated under these poor conditions. 
it's antiquated. Uh, the building is fairly old. I think they said it was built in the 30s. Uh, looks like it might have been hit a little bit during the war uh, back in the 90s. But there's a brand new hospital they're building outside. So I think a year, if we were back a year from now, instead of looking at the cracked ceilings and floors and kind of being surprised at how antiquated it was, we'd be probably surprised at how modern their facilities were. Buffalo orthopedic surgeon Mark Anders attributed these archaic conditions he is working under to economic pressure. It really depends on funding and, and uh, unfortunately as is all medicine, uh, um, a lot of what we do nowadays is expensive. As in orthopedics for example, I think what we see is there, it's not necessarily a lack of skill or a lack of interest, it's a lack of money for supplies. Um, as an example, we did simple arthroscopies which is something we take for granted. You know, certainly in the United States it's one of the most commonly performed procedures. Um, here they have some archaic instruments but they don't have a full set of anything so they had no hand instruments. They could do an arthroscopy and look in someone's knee but they actually couldn't do anything. Um, so, uh, and, and a lot of people have to travel a great distance to have any complicated procedures done. Um, the local economy is certainly not such that people can afford that so what seems to happen I think and is probably true in a lot of places is simple problems are neglected for a lack of funding um, and that's Again, something I don't completely understand, but that's my, my appreciation. For Buffalo orthopedic surgeon Craig Blum, these conditions he is working under are like nothing he has ever experienced. This was more primitive than what I expected, to be honest with you. Um, I know they had a problem with, um, you know, war with the, the countries around them, and, um, you know, the, apparently the hospital was actually attacked, and kind of their bullet holes on the outside in the, in the mason area that you can see. Um, and until the truce, I think it was in 1992. Um, um, so it's really, it's an eye-opener that you know, how people live in other places around the world. It really is. It makes you really appreciate being an American. You know, we just don't quite understand how much stuff that we really have and how lucky we are. The Hope for Tomorrow Foundation team dug right in. Vascular surgeon Dr. Harach Karamanukian, who is Armenian, bought his whole team. He taught one young doctor vein surgery techniques and donated $50,000 in equipment. Oh, they are very, very grateful. They all left smiling. A couple actually came back the next day to say thank you um, to the doctor and I for helping. Um, the doctor we're teaching, actually, he got to do a few on his own, so I got to assist him too, so it was very cool. It was very cool. It was a good experience. I'm working with Dr. Khachatrian. He's a vascular surgeon at the Republican Hospital in Gorna Karabakh. We uh, have donated a vein laser machine as well as an ultrasound machine and he has already learned how to do the endovenous ablation procedure. Uh, he's in the vein right now and this uh, 45 year old lady who's had a lot of symptoms in her legs, uh, heaviness and swelling and a lot of varicose veins problems and so he's, he would be the only surgeon in this country doing this type of procedure. The surgeons examined dozens of potential patients. This boy was born with his middle digits fused together on both hands and feet. Gregory comes from a poor family. He lives in a small one-bedroom apartment with his mother, father, aunt, grandmother, and two other siblings. His condition is hereditary. Thanks to the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation, he is the only one in the family who will have some relief from their hereditary condition through this donated surgery. To put this into perspective, the surgery that we performed on young Gregory back in the United States would have been worth almost five years of their salary down here. Um, so you can see how this is a very difficult thing for them to have done and it's fortunate that we were here to come and do it for them. They would otherwise never be able to have this young boy's fingers fixed and give him a normal hand again. Five years salary for where that surgery would just be something that a struggling family would not be able to afford. The income is about $40 per month or $600 per year income for the father who's a construction worker, which is a very poor income and it's very hard for them to pay to raise the children and almost impossible for them to pay for the surgery. It, it's an amazing experience just seeing the poverty, the, the difficult uh, situation, and that the children and the adults are able to get surgery that they never would have gotten if Hope for Tomorrow hadn't come here. 
Operating out of three surgical rooms, the doctors performed many different levels of surgery. Cases we've done so far are, um, we've done four arthroscopies or arthroscopic surgeries on the knee. Um, and uh, we've done uh, two shoulder operations, um, one for an infection, and then a, um, another one for a uh, young man whose shoulder kept on coming out of socket because of an injury. Um, and uh, just somebody came in off the street and had what we call a trigger finger, where his finger was locked, bent down because of a problem with inflammation in the tendon. And um, I was able to just massage it out straight and inject it with some cortisone. And it's like he didn't have it before. He was so grateful. You should have seen how his eyes lit up and how, how big his smile was. They say that young people are the future. And with that in mind, the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation has started a health sciences program. They have brought with them a group of health care students. Here, they can get experiences that they could never get at home. The students are from all different levels of medical training. One would become a doctor within a week of our return. Another is finishing up a PhD while others were just beginning their training or deciding if they want to be in the medical field. I think it's fantastic. The students get invaluable experiences. They get to experience uh, things that they don't get to do in their education at this point in their careers, in their educational careers. And um, I think that that helps them define what they want to do as they continue their education. So I think it's invaluable and they all say so. I was expecting to see a third world country that had a lot of dirt and filth as we did last year in Haiti when I went down to Haiti for the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation to Lake High. Um, I expected to see a lot more garbage everywhere. Um, I expected it to be smelly. Um, the hospitals I expected to be dirty. Um, it wasn't really exactly what I expected. So part of the experience through this medical mission as a healthcare practitioner in the future um, will help me to be able to embrace other cultures um, and respect them as well. So I was able to learn that on this trip, all the different um, things that are part of their culture and how to embrace them and respect them. Hope for tomorrow as we're getting larger and uh, we're doing more work around the world, uh, we're now focusing on the next generation of hopefully physicians and students that will participate with organizations like Hope for Tomorrow uh, from Buffalo and elsewhere. Now these young physicians and uh, uh, medically related students are getting experience which they definitely uh, could not obtain uh, at home because of our restrictions and uh, I think they're far ahead of their counterparts in their field they're able to make choices in terms of if they're interested in this kind of medicine, if uh, possibly they're really uh, in the wrong direction, they can, they've got hands-on experience uh, which will help them uh, for the rest of their lives. Gregory's story was just one of many occasions on the mission that presented a teaching moment for the students. They received hands-on experiences that was an opportunity of a lifetime this early in their careers. Kelly Fox, I'm from Buffalo, New York. I go to the Ontario Veterinary College and I study veterinary medicine. I learned a lot of things. I had never been in an operation room for humans before, so it was really interesting to see all the different techniques that they used. I'm Kristen Anders. I go to Syracuse University. I'm a biology major and I intend to go to med school. Um, I learned a lot about operating first of all I had never been in a room before and I got to stand side by side with my father who's an orthopedic surgeon so that was really awesome I got to see really what he does my name is Jessica Panapento I go to school at Damon College and my major is nursing I felt AAD was a little bit harder to understand um, it wasn't as organized because they're still uh, recovering from their earthquake and everything here they're trying to get back onto their feet so things are more organized, things got done a lot faster. Um, but both were absolutely an amazing experience and I've learned a ton from them. What do you think? Okay, do you know how to scrub? Yes? Yes. Okay, you're drying now. Students were wonderful to work with. They were like little sponges. They just absorbed everything. They just wanted to know more. And um, they were just so willing to do anything at all um, in order to take care of the patient and um, to learn what they could do. And that they were, they were amazing. The students were wonderful. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for the students, first of all, to see the way other people live, to see how difficult it is 
to get access to medical care and even if there is access there's no money for them to um, have certain procedures that they really require to live. Um, so I think it's a big eye-opener for them um, and it's a great opportunity for them to get exposed to medicine because uh, the, the physicians are very generous with their time here and um, they're really allowing the students to see the surgeries and participate in them. So it's a great opportunity for them. My name is Asher Blum. I'm a fourth year medical student at the American University of the Caribbean School of Medicine. And since I've been here, the experience has been more than I could ever imagine from being completely hands-on in surgery, doing some suturing and helping with laser ablation surgery, plastic surgery, orthopedic surgery, to just dancing with locals and visiting an orphanage and seeing how grateful the people here are to have us and how welcoming they've been and just to look around and experience a culture that I've never had the privilege to be able to be a part of. My name is Nicole Smolinski and I'm a student at the University of Michigan. I want to go pre-med and this is just a great opportunity for me to decide like if I really was interested in this, it was my first real exposure to medicine and being able to participate in the surgeries and be a part of just be a, be a part of the surgical team and being able to actually do something instead of just sit on the side and watch. It was just a great experience to be able to help, actually help people. Uh, my name is Tom McGarry. I'm a physical therapy student at Damon College. What I did actually see when we were here was uh, you know, beautiful people that are very friendly um, and that welcomed us with open arms and we were able to help them um, with vascular surgery. We've done several orthopedic cases um, that were very exciting to participate in. Um, those, as a physical therapy student and later on as a physical therapy professional, I'll never be able to have those experiences uh, again. So this is really a unique opportunity that I've been able to take advantage of. The college students, yes, they're, they're so enthusiastic. They scrub right in. Um, the doctors have been so patient with them and, and taught them and they, they were, the students really appreciated that. And uh, they were able to assist right with the surgery and get right in there and do it. And um, it's a wonderful thing to watch. My name is Ann Nykirk and I'm a physician assistant student at Damon College. And I was hoping um, from this trip to be able to have a hands-on experience. Um, this past year we um, were able to dissect in lab, but I didn't have a lot of hands-on experience with suturing and really seeing everything in practice. Um, so from this trip I have had that experience where I was able to, um, to suture and to be able to really connect all the pieces from everything that I've been learning in school and then also um, for a practical clinical experience. My name is Allison Peary and I'm a biomedical science student at UB. And the best part is that I get to see how the surgeries are going to affect these people's lives because a lot of them can't afford um, the surgeries that we're providing for them and they really are life-changing surgeries. So I think that's like the best, most gratifying part. My name is Aaron Pieri and I'm a political science major at UB. What I expected from this whole experience was not only to see medically what the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation does, but to get accustomed to what other types of societies there are other than the United States. I've never been overseas before so I really didn't know what to expect, but after coming here it gave me a wake-up call about how good it is to live in the U.S. The people are simple going about their daily lives with the shadow of war constantly hanging over them. Working in two hospitals, the doctors performed all types of surgeries. Most were war-related. I'm talking about the 70 years period of Soviet rule because it was a non-natural situation when we actually found ourselves within an alien country which was oppressing us constantly and it, uh, we were deprived of a normal development path and opportunities. When it was already impossible to bear this yoke, in 1988, our people actually uh, started this liberation movement. All peaceful demands uh, were actually encountered uh, with uh, war and imposed uh, military operations. There are many Armenians throughout the world who have never lived here. Their parents and grandparents left during the great genocide of the early 1900s. But they have closed ties to their native land. Vascular surgeon Dr. Armin Rupinian is one such person. Well, I think it's, uh, there were 
two things. One was the, the medical issues that we encountered, but more importantly, the learning the geopolitics of the area has been phenomenal for me. Uh, my background's Armenian, so I've learned a lot about the country and about the conflict, the Karabakh conflict. From the medical side, um, things are uh, certainly uh, better than I had expected. I mean, Mrs. Zapur Karamanukian and her son, Dr. Haraj Karamanukian, are such displaced Armenians. For Mrs. Karamanukian, this is a lifelong dream come true. I'm Armenian descent. I have some obligation. Now I feel myself a little strong because the new generation is standing up, taking much more education than before. You know, they are strong, they are, uh, 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 smart, you know, uh, smart and clever. They have the potential to reach the climax. But when we have a little kick from the outside, you know, we can fulfill and reach our goal. Even foundation members who could not make this trip got involved. Thousands of dollars in prosthetics and orthotic supplies were donated by Alex and Ursula Campanella. Although they are retired from the prosthetics and orthotics industry, they made these donations as they have many times in the past when they were able to come on the missions. This part of Armenia, Azerbaijan, which encompasses the Ngorno-Karabakh Republic, has been at war or under suppression almost constantly for centuries. It has created a permanent poverty class. Although it is primarily an agricultural society, it also has mining and is very active in the diamond industry. And not everyone is poor here. In Stepanakart, there's a thriving business district. And if you move around the city, you will discover middle class communities. But their economy is struggling, and they aren't looking for a handout, but a helping hand. In our opinion, uh, uh, so I would like to thank Nagorno-Karabakh Republic. Uh, uh, need uh, not just so in uh, uh, economical, uh, also uh, uh, in uh, intellectual, inter intellectual help. And, uh, it is uh, no, no less significant. In this tiny nation surrounded by enemies, faith is paramount. It is an all-Christian nation. With little to build with and even less to live on, faith in God plays a central role in their lives. She says that uh, she used to, uh, you know, pray for the peace of Barapal, and she begs from God, she begs from God in her, uh, she was begging to God that uh, let these uh, things our children don't see, it's enough. This proved to be another strong lesson for the American students as they visited an orphanage in Stepanakar. They discovered that poverty and the threat of war cannot dampen the spirit of the young left behind, that they have faith in a future that one day will be theirs. Those kids were inspiring. They were really amazing. They really were. I like their song, especially their English stuff. That was yes. really awesome. Well, and the was, one girl really loved you, Virginia. I think one of them came up to us and said hello in English. Yeah, yeah. 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 After the coffee, yeah, I was so surprised that a lot of it was so cute. They were so excited. Like, it was so. I'm still speechless. It was like so rewarding. It was just like. I still want to take one home. I can't even. I, I almost cried. It was so cute. Yeah, can, can we each have an orphan to take home with us, please? We gave yeah, them all so the presents, cute. and then they thought that they had to give them back. I know. I know. They know. They know. They they the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation understands faith. It was born out of faith. Faith by Pope John Paul II, who requested Dr. Jeffrey Mileman to go throughout the world to help needy children. This was after a group of Western New Yorkers traveled to Rome for a blessing by the Pope for a young girl the doctor had helped. Again, as it has done many times over the past 20 years, the group pilgrimaged to Rome for an audience with the Pope. They took the Vietnamese boy, Nguyen Chong Hu, who the doctor helped last year by removing a large growth on his face. 
There they were well received by the Holy Father. Pilgrims from the following parishes, members of the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation. Dear brothers and sisters, in our continuing reflection on prayer in the letters of St. Paul, we now consider the Apostle's striking affirmation that Jesus Christ is God's yes to mankind and the fulfillment of his promises, and that through Jesus we say our Amen to the glory of God. For Paul prays above all God's gift, grounded in his faithful love, which was fully revealed in the sending of his Son and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit poured forth into our hearts, lets us to the Father, constantly making present God's yes to us in Christ, and in turn enabling us to say our yes, Amen, to God. Our use of the word Amen, rooted in the ancient liturgical prayer of Israel, and then taken up by the early church, expresses our firm faith in God's word and our hope in his promises. So this daily yes, which concludes our personal and communal prayer, we echo Jesus' obedience to the Father's will, and so the gift of the Spirit are enabled to live a new and transformed life in union with the Lord. Greeting likewise goes to the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation from the United States. When the Pope blessed young Hu, it was a special moment that validated all of the 3,000 surgeries the organization has done over three decades. We tell Tonkin that he came here and got blessed by the Pope, and he's really excited and happy to be here today. And he's not Catholic, so this is something really new to him and really um, wonderful. Decades of communist rule and war has taken its toll on Stepanakart, and nowhere is it more exemplified and amplified than in its health care system. And although the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation has put a large dent in their medical problems, it is only a fraction of what they really need. But the people here are welcoming and grateful. In Stepanakart and Nagorno-Karabakh Republic, I'm Stan Coleman for the Hope for Tomorrow Foundation.